Welcome to WHBC TV. I greet you this morning with Christ's joy. The Bible said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will re rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you're making a choice this morning, regardless of your situation, regardless of your circumstances, that you're going to come into his gates with thanksgiving and you'll come and enter his courts with praise. This morning, we will be continuing our message series on the book of Jonah, entitled, All's Well, That's Hands Well. We'll be going to a very unique chapter this morning, chapter number four. I was asking God, God, why, would, why did you put Jonah chapter four in the Bible? You could have ended the book at Jonah chapter three, a very powerful and upbeat ending when the people of Nineveh gave their life to Jesus. But chapter four of Jonah, well, you got to come into the sanctuary. I'm going to invite you to come into the service with me as we go into the Word of God to find out why God included chapter 4 of the book of Jonah in the Word. The title of the message this morning is Jonah Arose. I'll come back and pray with you. As we continue in our message series on Jonah called all's well that ends well amen before you take your seat i've titled the message to you this morning jonah arros jonah arros Greet and shake the hands of two people around you and tell them Jonah Aros, Jonah Aros, Jonah Aros, Jonah Aros, Jonah Aros. Amen. Jonah Aros. Amen. You may be seated. You may be gladly seated, Jonah Aros. Not Toys Aros, but Jonah Aros. Amen. In the early 70s, there was a popular children's book out called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Later on, several films came out based on that storybook. And it's about a little boy named Alexander whose date is this started out bad and goes downhill from there. Alexander's story goes like this. I went to sleep with gum in my hair, in my mouth. And now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a covet stingray car kit in his breakfast cereal box. And Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box. But in my breakfast box, all I found was a breakfast cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson left Becky, let Becky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot, <laughs> you, you and that too, got seats by the window too. I said I was being scrunched, I said I was being smudged, and I said if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to be car sick. No one even listened. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. <laughs> At school, Mrs. Dickens liked Paul's picture of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. <laughs> At singing time, she said I sang too loud. 
at counting time, she said I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. I could tell because Paul said I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend and Albert Moyo was his next best friend and that I only is third best friend. I hope you sit on attack. I said to Paul, I hope the next time you get a double decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream part falls off the cone part and lands in Australia. <laughs> there were two cupcakes in Philip Parker's lunch bag. And Albert got a Hershey bar with almonds. And Paul's mother gave him a piece of jelly roll that had little coconut sprinkle on top. Guess whose mother forgot to put in dessert? <laughs> it was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. That's what it was. Because after school, we went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose red ones with white stripes. I chose blue one with red stripes. But the shoe man said, we're all sold out of that one. They made me buy a old plain white shoes. But they can't make me put it on. Then my mom took us all to the dentist and Dr. Fields found a cavity just in me. Come back next week and I will fix it, said Dr. Fields. Next week I said, I'm going to Australia. <laughs> there was lima beans for dinner. I hate lima beans. There was kissing on TV. I hate kissing. My bath was too hot. I, I got soap in my eyes. My marble went down the drain and I had to wear my railroad pajamas. I hate my railroad pajamas. When I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow he said I could keep. And the Mickey Mouse nightlight burnt out. And I beat my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony and not with me. It's been a terrible Horrible, no good, very bad. My mom says some days are like that, even in Australia. <laughs> Have you ever had a day like Alexander? A terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. Oh, I, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about days where nothing works out the way you want it to be. And by the time you fight your way home through bumper to bumper on Don Valley parking lot, you're just plain old drain and mad. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? You, 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 you young people on this side are looking at me like, like, like you, you've never had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. Let me go over here to your parents. Where, where, am I, where are my real people at here? Have you ever been where Jonah was? Down in the dumps. Feeling sorry for yourself. Somebody said all the time. <laughs> if you were with us last Sunday, you'd know Jonah had just delivered God's message to the Ninevites. I mean, the Holy Spirit moved with such a powerful presence that revival broke out in Nineveh. 
the great and wicked city that even the cats got saved. <laughs> if you know me, you know I hate cats because I'm allergic to cats. And that's why I don't think cats would be in heaven. <laughs> that, that, that's another story. Anyhow, 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 sorry for all the cat lovers there. <laughs> I, I know you still love me. Anyhow, Jonah chapter 3, verse 8, says, Both men and beasts and animals went repenting you all good God a revival broke out in an unusual place a revival broke out in a barren place a revival broke out in a dry place there's that tells me there's still hope for somebody here this morning Amen. oh I, I I know there's still hope for me Revival broke out in an unusual place. When we think of revival, we think of revival breaking out in, in places where it's ready for God. Wrong. Revival never breaks out where, in places where it's ready for God. Revival breaks out in barren places. And now they realize that they need God. And without God, they're lost. And they're desperate for God. Because if God, is, if God doesn't show up and show out, it's over. Have you ever been in a situation if God doesn't show up and show oh and show out is over? But first of all, if the Bible says there's a great rejoicing among the angels of God in heaven over one sinner, one sinner who repents, can you imagine the party that was going on in heaven on the day revival broke out in Nineveh? Jonah chapter 4 verse 11 tells us that they are more than 120,000 people in Nineveh. And I'll tell you next time we meet that that's just counting children. I'll tell you that later. Who got saved? And Jonah, our man Jonah, thought he was having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. What up with you, Jonah? Look, look at verse, look at chapter 4, verse 1. See, see, if you just go to Jonah chapter 4 and you don't read chapter 3, 2, 1, you wouldn't understand why Jonah got mad. Look, look at that. It says, it says, but he greatly displeased Jonah. Oh, oh. And he became angry. Why in the world would any preacher for that matter be mad and angry that people got saved under his preaching? Dickie Neal, you preach. Would you be mad if people got saved under your preaching? I know you. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? I don't know a single pastor, including me, or an evangelist that won't throw a party of their own. Forget about angels rejoicing in heaven. I, I don't know a pastor who won't throw a party of their own if an entire city of more than 120,000 people repented when you're preaching on a Sunday morning. But not Jonah! I, I will take my family to Swiss Chalet. And we would eat us some gospel chicken. The text says he is angry. But why? Please understand, my brothers and my sisters, that Jonah wasn't angry because he felt more people should have repented than the ones who repented. He wasn't even upset about the numbers. 120,000 people were a lot of people, you all. 
That's not a mega church. That's what we call a gigapopolis church. You know, there's mega church and there's gigapolis church. Gigabyte is more than megabyte. Jonah wasn't even angry because sinners had repented. He wasn't angry because sinners had repented. That's not his pet peeve here. But watch this. He was mad and upset that the wrong people had not been destroyed. Oh, oh, somebody missed that. Somebody missed that. Some of you are still sleeping. See, see, as far as Jonah was concerned, the Ninevites were the wrong kind of people. These weren't Jewish people like him. These were barbaric, ruthless, mean, nasty people who are tortured and killed thousands of Jewish people. Ah! Now, we know why Jonah ran off to Tarshish when, when God said go to Nineveh. Because as a patriotic Jew, he didn't want the enemy of his people to be blessed by his God. So he says to the Lord in verse 2, look at it, verse 2. Was this not why I fled to Tarshish when you told me to go to Nineveh? Because I know you are a gracious and compassionate God and one who relents concerning calamity. He was saying, Lord, I know you won't burn them up because you are a good God. But if you won't burn them up, I'll burn up myself. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what the Hebrew word for become angry. Here means in verse 1, become angry, you see? Here in verse 1, it means to burn up. To become angry means to, bur to, to burn up. Uh, you know how you feel when you're angry, don't you? Now, Jonah was burning because Nineveh wasn't. This is like the, this is like when the Japanese, put the picture up. This is like when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and killed nearly 3,000 Americans. This is like what happened on 9-11, uh, when the Taliban slammed the plane like a missiles into the World Trade Center, killing again nearly 3,000 people. On both occasions, Americans were enraged. So can you imagine an American wishing a Taliban well. Can, can, you, can you imagine an ISIS, an American saying to an ISIS, live long and prosper? <laughs> no. In my study, the computer, I was reading that a young American soldier got enlisted in the US Army during the Iraq War simply because his parents were killed on 9-11 and he joined the army to get to, to, to go fight the Taliban so he could get his revenge. Give me the light point. Oh. Bitterness feels good while you are in it. Oh, let me say that again. Bitterness feels good while you're in it, oh, oh, let me help you bring this message more closer to home. You know how you can't stand seeing your haters get blessed? Especially get blessed like you get blessed? Or get blessed more than you get blessed? Oh, you're quite, you're quite on me now. You're quite on me now. I really brought this home. You, you know the jerk, the jerk at your work will get a promotion and you didn't? Oh Lord, help me preach this message. Let me preach this message this morning too, till somebody gets it. You, you know when someone you can't stand. I know we're all in church and, and, and 
so 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 you all can you all can pretend you don't know what i'm talking about i i, I saw i said when you when, when someone you can't stand god what you've been praying for for 20 years she got a man and all you got is a cat <laughs> Amen. You're not going to bother with me this morning. Amen. Do you throw a party for them? Oh, I know who I throw a party for. <laughs> if I ever throw me one, I throw one, I throw a party for me. And it's called pity party. And I invite only three people, me, myself, and I. <laughs> Surely, if you're going to have to suffer, if you're going to have to suffer, there has to be somebody out there who you are not so crazy about, whom you'd want hard to get in on it with you. Am I being real here this morning? Or, or I'm just the one who's talking it out, what you're thinking? And, oh. Misery loves Jesse, but that's not what really boggled my mind in this text. What really boggled my mind in this book is that the guy who is preaching in Nineveh today was only in the belly of the fish a few days ago himself. You know why, don't you? Here is God sending a sinner to another sinner oh oh oh, oh. Let, let, let me just come up here on the stage and stay here this morning he is God sending a rebellious prophet to pronounce judgment on a rebellious people I would have felt better if Jonah's sin had been a few years old <laughs> You know how we feel about sin when they get hold? In church, you only, you only hear folks give testimony after it's 20 years old. You know, 20 years ago, I, I, used, to, I used to do drugs. And God snatched me out of it. Praise God, hallelujah. I'm walking in victory. But people don't stand up and give a testimony of what they did last night. Oh, <laughs> you know, last night I got in bed with a man I was dancing with at a club, and this morning I woke up and I don't know how he got into my bed. I rebuke you, devil. <laughs> no. We give testimony about old stuff. Since we're used to old testimonies, I would have felt better if Jonah's sin had been a few years old. At least it won't be a shock him. After all, it's a long time ago. And you know there's a statue of limitations. <laughs> and you know there's a statue of limitations to every crime. But when it was only just a few days ago, that Jonah was in a mess himself and God was now sending Jonah to the Ninevites with the same vaccination of mercy that cured him from his sin oh oh this is why I love the Word of God see see no one can better help to snatch somebody going to hell from going to hell than someone who themselves have been through hell No one can better help a drug addict or an alcoholic than someone who is a drug addict or an alcoholic. There must be some, some, some kinship between the redeemed and the person, between the redeemer and the one who is being redeemed. 
uh, this is why God the Father sent uh, God the Son uh, in flesh uh, as my Redeemer uh, so he can be kin to me as my king's man Redeemer. Oh, you're not hearing me this morning. What did you say? What did you say? The writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, I read the writer of Hebrews saying, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things. Somebody shout all things. Who has been tempted in all things? Who? Why was he tempted in all things? He has to be tempted in all things. So he can know what Sashi is going through. What Kuma is going through. What's your name? Bradley is going through. <laughs> what Sister Iceland is going through. So he can know what everyone here. That word all things is so huge. But not huger than what is following. Yet without sin. So he can have the power to bear it. See, see, until you have been tortured, or, or, until you have been touched, until you have been touched by the very disease you're trying to cure, you won't have the right attitude and the right perspective needed to bring about a change. If you've never been down and broke, you won't know how to help people who are down and broke. All of my people here who have been down or broke or both. Look at three people around you and tell them, I feel you, 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 I feel you. Yes, 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 I can help you, I feel you, I can help you, I feel you, I got you, I can feel you, I can help you. Now understand. I now understand, absolutely, undoubtedly, I now understand why God, because we said he's a compassionate God, right? Yeah. And a loving God, right? Now I now understand why God had to let Jonah be in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. Why didn't he take him out on the first night? Why does he have to make him go through three days and three nights in hell? I now understand why. So this evangelist can experience what hell feels like. So when he's preaching to these hell-bound Ninevites, turn or burn, he will preach it with mercy. Hello, somebody. He will preach it with mercy because he's been through hell and back himself. But what really boggled my mind? I still haven't told you what boggled my mind yet. I told you this guy just make he just kills me. I, I, I had to stop in verse 8. But what really boggled my mind is Jonah's rebellious sin against God was still so fresh. Like a fresh coat of paint. Dickie Neal, you know what I'm talking about. This wasn't an old testimony. This was just a few days old. And Jonah was the, li the, least, the least interested in God showing mercy to the Ninevites. Even as he has received mercy. In the belly of a whale just a few days ago. Come on, somebody talk to me. Isn't it crazy how we want mercy, but we want our haters to get justice? Like a soldier who was fighting in Iraq war. And he received a letter from his girlfriend that said she was breaking up with him. She asked him to send the picture she had given him when he, when he, when he was leaving uh, and it was the, because it was the best picture she's ever taken and she needed that picture to announce a bridal engagement to this new guy. 
The soldier was heartbroken. Anybody here ever been heartbroken? <laughs> he told all his friends of his terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. So his whole platoon, his whole platoon got together and brought all the, the pictures of their girlfriends and they put them in a box and gave it to him. So he put his girlfriend picture in the box with the rest along with a note that said, I'm sending back your picture to you. Please remove it and send back the rest. For the life of me, I can't even remember which one you are. <laughs> Come on now. Bitterness. Bitterness feels good while you're in it. Bitterness feels good while you're in it. I mean, Jonah was so caught up in his bitterness that he says to the Lord in verse 3, Lord, please kill me. I want to die. Kill me. Kill. You didn't want to kill the Ninevites? Kill me. For death is better to me than life. You know, if I was God, I would have killed him. <laughs> but that's why I'm not God. <laughs> this guy is such a suicidal preacher. First, he wanted to die in chapter 1. You, you remember when he, th he told the sailors to throw him into the, into the sea? Yeah. So he wouldn't go to Nineveh. <laughs> now he's saying to God, kill me. In verse 8, keep reading down in verse 8. He will say it again, kill me. Jonah is such a suicidal guy. But oh, 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 oh I, I love, I love the Lord's response to Jonah in verse 4. You got to look at this with me. And the Lord said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry, Jonah? Can you sense the Lord's patience here? God could have made Jonah's tongue stick to the roof of his mouth. For getting mad at God like that. And he'll go around talking like, <laughs> But God didn't do that. What a merciful God we serve. Oh, angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adores him. What a mighty God we... Oh, church, 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 church. His mercy... Do you have people in your life that you're putting up with? Yes. <laughs> or do you have people in your life that are putting up? <laughs> if there's ever a, an example of someone who God is putting up with, it's Jonah. Instead, the Almighty God who could have struck Jonah dead, only asked him a question. Do you have any good reason to be angry, Jonah? Good God of heaven. And as I was preaching, as I was, as I was preparing this message, the Kinkuma, I was asking the Lord, Lord, why do you want me to preach chapter 4 of Jonah this morning? Wouldn't it have been wonderful and splendid if this book ended on a high positive note as we saw in chapter 3 where he went to Nineveh and he began to preach the word of God and, and the whole city revival broke out. Lord, wouldn't that have been fantastic for the book to finish on a positive note like that? But why does chapter 4 
have to be included like a spoiler to a good movie. Have you ever watched a good movie? And, and great plot, great scene, great story, and there was this only one sexual plot and a, a few coarse language that weren't necessary in the story? It just ruined it. it, it it's not even needed. It has nothing to do with the story. Me and I, we saw a movie not too long ago, and they just took, I, what, where did that come from? What was that all about? You don't need it. But the movie director just kind of threw these scenes there anyway, because, you know, some people, that's what they look for in a movie. So I asked the Lord, why did you include chapter 4 in this book? Chapter 3 would have been a perfect ending to not so good a beginning. Ah. Chapter 3 would have been a perfect ending to not so good a beginning. Uh, that tells me here, somebody here, it's not about how you begin, it's about how you end. Oh, your beginning may be rough, but God says to tell you this morning that the days that are ahead of you are going to be better and greater than the days that was behind you because the rest of your days are going to be, be the best of your days. If you believe that, say amen. amen. But I'm still not there yet because you have to come back in three weeks when we talk about all's well that ends well. Because <laughs> all ain't ending well yet. Because we, I said, Lord, why would you bring to us to chapter 4? He says, somebody in here this morning needs to understand that there's a Jonah in you that you realize. There's a Jonah in us. Jonah Haros. Come on, talk to your neighbor one more time and tell him Jonah Haros. Jonah Haros. <laughs> hey, Jonah Haros. Because the thrust, the thrust of this chapter is rather than seeing Jonah just as a Jewish prophet who lived and died uh, several thousands of years ago, I think we have to see how we are so much like him if we are to embrace the message of this book. Are you following what I'm saying? So, for the remainder of our time, let me quickly share with you two adjustments. <laughs> two adjustments the Lord wants us to make. Two adjustments the Lord wants us to make whenever we find ourselves like Jonah, having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad. <laughs> Who here is ready to receive? Come on, talk to your neighbor and say, ready or not? Ready. Number one. Attitude adjustment. Woo! <laughs> attitude adjustment. Look at what Jonah did next in verse 5. The Lord, you remember the Lord asked him, only one question in verse 4. Jonah, do you have any good reason to be angry? Did you notice Jonah did not answer God? Ah, look at verse 5. Instead, verse 5. <coughs> Instead, Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. He went out from the city and sat east of it. Doing what? <laughs> Pouting! Pouting! There! He sat under it, under the shade, until he could see what would happen in the city. 
I mean, this guy is one big odd ball. Jonah was waiting for the city to burn up. He said to himself, I I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit out here. <laughs> and I'm going to park for 37 days. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, you remember God gave the Ninevites how many days to repent? 40. Everybody say 40 days. 40 days. Now, 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 now. Now, uh, when I got into Nineveh, it was um, on this date, yeah, day one, day two, day three. It took three days for him to preach to them. So how many days are left? 37. Take three out of 40. How many days, church? 37. 37 days. So, 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 Jonah sits counting 30 days. Nothing happened. 31. Ah, oh yeah, okay, Lord, ah, you're going to play this all out at the end, eh? Last minute, 32. 33. 34. I wouldn't name, I wouldn't name names. When one of my kids, when he was very little and he was mad, he would be going like, I wouldn't name names. 35. His it, it, nerves, he's it, it, getting to his last nerves now. 36. Oh. This, this got to be the D-Day. This got to be the D-Day. One o'clock. Two o'clock. Three o'clock. Four. Five. Six. Eight. Nothing happened. <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me go back. Let me go back. He's sitting out there pouting. I won't move until you, until you all see what I'm saying. For 37 days. It's one thing for you to lose three days and three nights of your life. We saw that in chapter 1. Now he's willing to lose 37 days. Of inactivity, of improductivity, 37 days. Pouting. To see if God will nook the Ninevites. Jonah sounded like, like a cat to me. You know when cats don't get what they want? They go in the corner of the house and pout. Meow. They go in the corner. Meow. They, they look at you. Meow. They, they raise their backs on you. Meow. Until they can get their way. I love dogs, even though I'm allergic to dogs. Dogs are not like that. Ooh. For better or for worse. Your dog is all over you, licking you. <laughs> but cats will go in the corner. Meow. This is bad. Jonah, a prophet of the Most High God, is prepared to sit out there for 37 days. I got a cat. <laughs> I should use you as my line there. Do that again. I, I, I'm, I'm going to sit out here. Do that. Somebody do that again. Meow. And I'm going to suck for 37 days to see if I can get my way. 
You know, to tell you the truth, I've always found that, I've always found that to be an effective strategy to use for my wife. <laughs> when, when I want something, I tell her what I want. If she doesn't give it to me, I go off and suck and pout until I get what I want. Meow. <laughs> Sometimes for 37 days. <laughs> oh, have you ever, have you ever witnessed, have you ever witnessed a child throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of a mall? Hopefully it wasn't yours. When Adam was little, I'm going to talk about it. When Adam was little, oh my goodness, he would throw a temper tantrum on me and his mother in the mall. And that was because he was the only child then. Uh, you know, you're the only child, you, you think you can get away with anything, right? So, 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 so he'd be lying on the floor, eh, screaming at the top of his like, eh. And I would just look at him and I would walk away. <laughs> Pretending like ah, this is not my child. I don't know him. <laughs> but meanwhile, meanwhile, yes, his mom, his mom would, his mom would just, beside, just kneel beside him and go, stop it, stop it. I'm giving something. <laughs> you, you don't want to say that too loud. Stop it. <laughs> but what is so gracious? What is so gracious about our God is even while Jonah was having this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, verse 6 says, God appointed, give it up, put it up, put it up. God appointed a plant. And it grew up. Another miracle grew <laughs> Not a miracle grow. They think miracle grow is a modern day phenomenon. Wrong. You don't read Jonas was to see miracle grow. Over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. What discomfort? You, you remember? I told you last yes last Sunday that when he came out of that fish, three days, three nights. What did that gastric juice of the of the fish did to his skin? It bleached him. Jonah became an albino. And you know, albinos don't like sun. I, gave you, I told you I was going to give you that proof of that. Discomfort. Even in, even, even in mercy. And the text says, and Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Only time Jonah is happy so far. Plant? <laughs> you have no clue the character that sometimes God uses for his work. He showed that no man will get the glory when it's finished. So that every mouth will be silenced before me. Because if you all that, you think you did all that by yourself. Verse 7, keep reading, verse 7. But God appointed a worm. <laughs> and it attacked the plant. And withered. Because worms love plants. Verse 8. And it came about when the sun came up. Another appointment. God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die again. Lord, kill me. Just kill me. You know why? Because the Lord killed his plant. Because the Lord killed his plant.
Come on, church. Jonah was having a will of attitude here. Maybe because he just came out of a will. Sorry, no pun intended. He was having a will of an attitude. I mean, this bro has an attitude problem. Do you know someone who has a bad attitude problem? Don't, don't raise up your hands. <laughs> because they may be sitting next to you. And I don't want, I don't want no World War III starting in your home when you get, a church, or get home. What do you mean? What do you mean I have a bad attitude? I saw you raised up your hands when the pastor said, you know someone with bad attitude. <laughs> so if you know someone, just nod your head and I will see you. Or better still, maybe it's you yourself who is in need of an attitude adjustment. God asked Jonah the second time, verse 9. Second time. Jonah, do you have any good reason? See, I told you why he was mad. You all thought I would pull that. To be angry about the plant? The plant of all that would... Yeah, yeah. You sit down there and go, yeah. He's, he's angry at the plant. I'm not angry at the plant. I'm angry at Shinene and Jack and Ray Ray. <laughs> You'll be shocked at some inconsequential things that get us on the edge. Satan is not after your car. Hey, the devil is in my car. No. Satan don't need your car. Oh. Satan is after my marriage. Wrong. Satan is not after your marriage. Are you serious? After your marriage? Uh, there's sometimes... I've seen you drive past your house. You, you don't want to even go in there. <laughs> why, why, would Satan, why would Satan want what you... <laughs> Satan is not after any things. Satan is after you, your faith. Get it? Where is Jonah's faith in all this, church? Plant! I'm almost done. Let me give you the lifeline. Perhaps the best way, the best way an attitude change begins, the best way an attitude change begins is by asking yourself this question. Do I have a good reason to feel this way? Do I have a good reason to be thinking this way? Do I have a good reason to be acting this way? When you're able to answer that, then you're able to con conquer what you're willing to confront. Jonah still wasn't ready. Notice, notice. This time, even though Jonah answers God back, the first time he didn't answer God back, this time he answered God back, but he still wasn't ready. Look at what Jonah said. <coughs> Look at what Jonah said, verse 9. Keep reading. Look at what he said in verse 9. Jonah said, I have good reason to be angry. As a matter of fact, God, I have good reason to be angry. Huh? Huh? This guy is playing with God. Church, church, this guy really needs a will of an attitude adjustment. It's like the grandfather who lay down on his lazy boy chair in the living room to have his afternoon nap. And one day the grandkids decided to play a practical joke on, on him. They put Limburger cheese on his mustache. church. You all know Limburger cheese? Little later he was awake. 
sniff it. He said to himself, hmm, why? This room stinks. Hey, this room stinks. So, so he got up to get away from the smell. He went into the kitchen. He was there not long and he goes, hmm, boy, this kitchen stinks too. So he decided to take a, a, a walk outside for a fresh bed of hair. Much to grandpa's surprise, he got outside and the smell was still following him. In utter frustration, he yelled out loud, man, the whole world stinks. Come on now. And the truth is, some of us like Jonah or Grandpa are going around with a chip on our shoulders and we're thinking it's the whole world that stinks when what really stinks is... Oh, oh, somebody here, somebody here. An apple, an apple doesn't fall too far from... Don't you know that? Jonah's attitude... To put it bluntly, stinks. And I know you don't have to tell me. I know every now and then my attitude gets out of the sink too. But so does yours. Uh, come, you don't have to just say amen to mine. Say amen hundred times to yours too. Amen. Hello, somebody. See, see, see. I can tell you already. I can tell some of you already have an attitude. Your attitude is showing. The truth is, the Ninevites deserves judgment. But Jonah is acting like this, as if he is someone who did not deserve judgment. The Ninevites might be undeserving of mercy, but no more than Jonah. Jonah, don't you know, as Psalm 130, verse 3 says, You, O oh Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who can stand? If you start going around and start chopping people's head off, who will stand? Somebody holler, nobody. Oh, maybe I should get me your last man to come in here this morning. And teach us how to say nobody. <laughs> verse 4. Verse 4. But there's forgiveness. But there's forgiveness with you. That you, O oh Lord, may be feared. Come on, where are, any, where are all my forgiven people in this place? Let me hear you give the Lord your forgiving praise. <laughs> that you know if it wasn't him. If it wasn't him. But, but the, point, the point that I want you to see as I close is we are no different than Jonah. We are no different than Jonah. Jonah or us. Talk to me, somebody. And there are people in your life and in my life that we can't stand because they look different, talk different, smell different, dress different, act different, worship different. Ooh, I'm getting your Kool-Aid right now. God forbid if they should walk into the church and Auntie Amna ushers them to sit beside you. Fireworks. Come on, who is your Ninevite? If Jonas are us, everybody in here has a Ninevite. Automatically. You can't say Jonah are us and say I don't have a Ninevite. Who is your Ninevite? Oh, oh I, I'm going to make this message real before I go take my seat for communion. I, I'm talking about when our comfort zone gets squeezed like Jonah's plant got eaten by a worm. Maybe you're, not a, maybe you're not about a plant. But what is your comfort zone that gets squeezed and put you on the edge? See, see, most Christians, 
most Christians are all for outreach and evangelism and reaching the lost for Christ and all that until people start taking their parking spot at the church. <laughs> and they start sitting in your comfy chair. You, you know that comfy section you love to sit in every Sunday? Every Sunday I know where everybody sits. Some, some, of you, some of you are good. Some of you are good. You, you, you're getting the message. But some people... I... <laughs> and God forbid, God forbid, if, if Mother Amna or any of the ushers ask you to move so a visitor, a visitor can take your seat, oh, oh, you won't be talking to my Mother Amna Till next year's Easter's. <laughs> oh, and when they have children, and when they have children running around, whew, would that would that we would rather wish they, they went to somewhere else to go get saved. At that moment, God's concern, God's concern, what concerns God's heart. What moves God's heart is no longer our concern as long as we are comfy like Jonah. Amen. But oh, Wama! Oh, Wama! To use the words of the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, though we are speaking. Though we're speaking of these things this way. For you, we think better things. Even though I'm talking like this. I, I, I'm saying all that because there are churches like that today. The uppity up, the nose up churches. But I thank God, Wema is not like that. I mean, take a look at us. Look at the diversity in this place. We have accountants sitting beside painters, and we have bricklayers sitting beside business administrators, and we have, oh, thank you, Jesus. We have factory workers sitting beside university professors. And here we celebrate our single folk, just as we celebrate our married folk. Here we celebrate our seniors, just as we celebrate our juniors <laughs> here it's if you are rich you're welcome <laughs> if you have not you're welcome because here in the body of Christ we are one yeah. at the foot of the cross at the foot of the cross the ground is level it's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's not a brown thing. It's not a popping thing. Oh, somebody turn to your neighbor and say, it's a Jesus thing. It's a Jesus thing. And so, we, by God's grace, we will keep our attitude in check. And everybody said, Communion time. Hi, welcome back. I trust the message this morning was a blessing to you. Listen, we ran out of time. I couldn't give you the second adjustment that the Lord would want us to make when we are having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. This morning we saw what Jonah was going through. Having a pity party. Having a, 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 a will of an attitude of problem toward God, toward God. And this morning, the, the, the thrust, the thrust of the book of Jonah chapter four is to remind you and I, lest we think Jonah is just a Old Testament Jewish prophet that lived and died several thousand years ago and think it has nothing to do with us. But the truth of the matter is, as we heard this morning, Jonah are us. Jonah are us. And, and, and I gave you the first, the first adjustment that you need to make, which is number one, attitude adjustment. 
and where to begin a change in your attitude is by simply asking why do I have a right do I, do I have any reason do I have any reason to feel this way until we can answer that question we will still be pouting and having a terrible horrible no good very bad day but God has so much so much in store for you Jonah God has so much in store for me as we see in the line, line of Jonah I'm going to invite you to come back as we look at the second second adjustment that we all need to wait sorry sorry I'm sorry to put you under suspense but it's going to come next time we meet but for this moment let me just pray with you that God would his long suffering and his patience will not run out on you he will not run out on me because the Bible said he will not always strive with us but as long as this day is called the day we should not harden our hearts and so I pray that God we will not harden our heart toward God as Jonah did that we we will love what God loves and we will be concerned about what God is concerned about as individuals and as a church for that matter so let me pray with you father in the mighty name of Jesus I thank you for our viewer this morning watching this broadcast whether they're watching at in the morning or in the afternoon or at night father may the blessing of this day be upon them Lord do what only you can do in their situation our horrible and terrible and no good and very bad day it could be Lord you can turn things around oh you're the God of the turnaround you're the God of the do-over so I pray dear God that you would help them to be still and know that you're God even in their situation and father give us that right attitude creating us a clean and right attitude toward you that what concerns you will concerns us and what breaks your heart will break our heart father give us a wonderful week we love you and we honor you and we adore you and we declare there's no one like you God in Jesus mighty name amen amen listen I trust again you were blessed and that prayer was for you we'd love to hear your comments comment us at the bottom of your screen or better still you can comment on your Facebook or on your uh, YouTube wherever you're watching this message and let us know how it's been a blessing to you because in you being blessed we are blessed and together God is glorified amen amen we love you and we invite you to come back next week same station invite a friend share this WHBC to YouTube with a friend and you will be blessed love you and we'll see you again.